It's California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz, and we're in Sacramento today, and we are joined by Ian Calderon, member of the California State Assembly. So I want to go back to 2000. Uh, sadly, my father-in-law was facing a, uh, a terminal diagnosis, and we had heard that there was a drug that may be able to assist him. The drug was not approved. And through a series of connections, we were able to get through to the right entity that would allow him to try the drug. But as this was happening, I thought to myself, you know, uh, I'm connected. Why should I have that benefit? You know, because I happen to know someone that can get me to the right person. Right. And that begs the question with regard to what you're looking at with AB 159. Yes, Right to Try Act. And mm -hmm. right now in the state of California, there is no rule of law that allows you to try these experimental drugs. So if you're given a terminal diagnosis, mm -hmm. there's no way to get access to these drugs. Uh, the FDA does offer us in this state a compassionate use program. And that's what happened with my father-in-law. Right, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, it still takes weeks and months. And if you're given a six-month diagnosis, right. months is, that's yeah, life. Right. And so basically what this bill does, it doesn't require anybody to do anything. It just allows you the ability to try those experimental drugs or treatments without being, you know, having the state get involved and keep you from doing so. But, does it direct the FDA to allow you to do it? Because you know, there's a state mm -hmm. federal law issue, so I'm right. trying to figure out how can we as a state tell the FDA what to do, or how is that, how would that well, work? We're not telling the FDA to do anything, mm -hmm. just like we're not telling the drug manufacturers right. to do anything, the doctors to do anything. We're mm -hmm. just giving everybody the ability to make the choice to use mm -hmm. the drugs. And we're not usurping, well, obviously because we can't, right. federal law. We're just saying the state of California is going to allow you to try those drugs. So if the doctor wants to prescribe it, he can. If you as a patient want to try it, you can. The drug manufacturer, if they want to give it to you, they're not required to. I understand. But they can. And if you're an insurance provider, if you want to cover it, you can. What if you don't? What if the three that you mm -hmm. just defined want to provide it, but the insurance co uh, company doesn't? I mean, well, do we mean... need to direct them to do that? No, it, it's their choice. They can choose to cover it or not. Mm -hmm. And so that's the real point of this law, is mm -hmm. it gives everybody the ability to allow that access without requiring anybody to do anything. So you could absolutely have an insurance company that's willing to, to cover those mm -hmm. costs, which is great because it makes it cheaper for the patient, but insurance provider may not want to provide that coverage. What about protections? How do you make sure that someone's not taking a drug that is harmful? I mean, you know, it's mm -hmm. a slippery slope and I don't want to go down that path. But in the end, are there backstops? Look at every prescription that would qualify for this program, which by the way only comes after you've exhausted all I FDA see. approved methods, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. has to have the basic uh, cons uh, Efficacy. Efficacy. Mm -hmm. So every drug that you can try mm -hmm. is, is, has a basic level of standard that you can take it as a human mm -hmm. and not necessarily die from right, it. Right. So it has that basic standard so that you can take the drug and still be fine. Um, but the idea here is we're not trying to do anything other than to allow that access. So that's more beyond the scope of the bill in terms of what you're talking about. What are you hearing? Are you getting legs on this? I know there's a lot of attention being paid to a bill to allow uh, doctor-assisted suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Monning's involved in that to model Oregon. So there's a lot of talk mm -hmm. on these types of end-of-life issues. Are you getting some momentum here? Yeah, there absolutely is a lot of momentum. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this issue has passed four other state legislatures. Oh, really? mm -hmm. uh, Louisiana, Michigan, and Whatever, a couple maybe. of yeah, anyways, yeah. Uh, but all bipartisan with not one no vote. Ah. And then this past year in Arizona, they put it on the ballot, and, and seventy-eight percent of the wow. voters that okay. voted voted yes. Okay. So because this has been bipartisan in actually conservative states, right. with conservatively controlled legislatures, I feel that uh, this is something that'll be, that absolutely can be successful in this state. Nope. And a progressive state like right. California should have this law on the books. What are your Republican friends saying? Uh, they're all wanting to co-author. Oh, really? That's a good <laughs> sign. So if someone doesn't make it, we know that in the 21st century, they have left an electronic trail that is miles and miles long. There's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's a whole host of electronic records that the family may need to access. How do they access it today? So right now, with regards, and, and, and you're moving into AB 691. Right, yes, yes. Like that segue, how'd I do? I like that segue. Exactly, how'd I do? Okay. Uh, and so this is the Privacy, Expe Privacy Expectations mm. and After Life Choices right. Act. Because right now, there is no law that says, you know, when I pass away, what happens to my online profiles? Right. And 
are these tech companies uh, or internet companies, are they required to hand over their, that information? So re- this is kind of a gray area where there, it, there just is no the law. Wild I mean, this literally, we are making law. I right. mean, today we are, and it's new law, it's laws we need to make. Right. It's not like you're reinventing. I mean. Right. So right now, yeah. it's really, you got to go to a court and these, the right. court have to, has to require these companies and to that, hand over that information. And that's the law now. And that that's the, the way it works mm-hmm. right now. So what this law does is it just takes these companies that would be in the middle and takes right. them so that they're not in the middle any right. longer. I'm sure they're and thrilled. They don't want to have to deal with this. They don't, especially considering the right. time that they're going to have to be dealing with families. And so this places it in the user's hands. So either on so, their websites, okay. they can, through their settings, if oh, I pass away, right. you can oh, that's interesting. Uh, hand over my information or oh. in a written will say, I want all my online profile information to be handed over, and this is because a Zogby did a poll sure. where seventy percent of everybody that took that poll said that they believe that after they die they should have privacy rights, and that their information, right. unless they said otherwise to have it turned over, should not be t- turned over. So not and not only protects the deceased, but it also protects the 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 person in which the deceased so, was communicating with. In theory, the deceased can say before the, his death, his or her death. I don't want this turned over. Right. So you're as part of this bill, you that would be fine. It's just you want the deceased wishes to be clear right. and allow the company's people to act on those wishes. Exactly. Have you spoken with the Facebooks and the Twitters and all those? I mean, are they jumping in on this? I have. I would presume they are. Yeah, this is a, a, absolutely one of the bills that they're working on with me. I mean, mm-hmm. th- we are partners in this, and this mm. is something that they're working on in other legislatures. Mm. But this is kind of the new rule. This is the new standard. Mm-hmm. And so, if this works here in California. California, sure. this is what they're going to be implementing in other states. And it's apropos given that you're chair of the Arts and Entertainment and Sports and Tourism and Media yeah. Committee, whatever it's called. And I got to ask you about the tax credit that passed last year for the entertainment industry. California was bleeding entertainment shops. We had a tax credit program of $100 million. Is it 333 now? Yes. $333 million. That's a tripling. Is that mm-hmm. enough? Has it it been enough? Well, it's not just the $330 million, it's the over five years. Before the program was $100 million a year for only two years. I see. So more certainty uh, is what you got, but you also made us more, it, it allowed us to be more competitive. So these big budget motion picture productions, they were not able to qualify for our film right. tax credit program, but now they are. And I'm hearing other states like North Carolina, ah, because of what we've done, right. they no longer going to offer a program because they can't compete with us in this state. And, and so how do we make sure the programs are implemented in such a way that it's not just benefiting the Hollywood corporations? I mean, I, I know what mm-hmm. the argument is, but how do we make sure that we all benefit, the entire community benefits? Well, I mean, think about it. These are, these are jobs. I mean... Billions of dollars are generated in revenue that comes back to the state that we then put into disability services right. and education because of this industry. And the point of the film tax credit isn't because we believe the entertainment industry needs more money because right. they're not making enough. Right. It's those middle class jobs, union jobs that that industry creates, those well paying jobs that stay here in the state, which keeps families together, and then we generate revenue off of that. That's direct and not even. To, to include indirect spending when they're filming in your town and they use your local hardware store. What else is on the agenda in your committee? I mean, that was such a big push for the last few years. What's popping? Well, I mean, you have issues with drones. In drone ah, yes. Use. Oh, that's a good one. That's a, that's a good issue. Can I just tell you? So my daughter is in seventh grade. Mm. Seventh grade. She's playing soccer at a school in the Westlake Village area. Seventh grade. The other team has a drone flying over the game, filming the game. Wow. I didn't even know, I look, I'm like, what, what is that? I didn't know what, I mean. I bet you wanted to see the footage. I did want to see the footage, but think about that. I mean, should yeah. that be permissible? Well, I don't, know. I don't know. That's what we're working on. And there's, look at, anything below 300 feet is state, but anything above yeah. that is, is um, controlled by the feds. So what are people saying? Well, you know, well, what's the industry saying? Well, I mean, I, I think that there's, we're trying to strike a balance between that you know, recreational use and then the issues of privacy. Yeah. And, and so we're trying to fix that. We're dealing with arts education funding again. Oh, sure. And I'm trying to work with the entertainment industry along with the tech industry to see if there's maybe a private sector solution to funding okay. um, arts education. He is Ian Calderon, member of the California State Assembly. I'm Brad Pomerantz in Sacramento. It's California Edition.